So welcome to today's seminar. I'm going to talk about the Strategic Priorities Fund program Landscape Decisions, which is funded by UK Research and Innovation and by a range of different research councils within UKRI. The program context of this ten and a half million pound program is the uh, scientific research that is needed to underpin the DEFRA 25 year environment plan. It also has the objective to help deliver a green Brexit and replace the common agricultural policy by the European Union that the UK has um, left on the 1st of January. Um, it will implement environmental land management, the DEFRA 25 year plan as part of this um, undertaking. Um, and that replaces the um, agricultural subsidies that are paid to landowners and farmers under the previous common agricultural policy. Um, the program also aims to develop some methods for integrative analyses of landscapes and land users through the methods of natural capital assessments, ecosystem services accounting, and to represent people and values, the sense of place that people have in their local landscapes, as well as the identity and heritage and well-being of local communities at multiple different scales. All of this happens in the context of the digital data revolution, where more and more data sets are available through social media. It's much easier to engage large amounts of diverse people, um, provided they have access to the internet and uh, computer. Um, and of course, data from Earth observation, from space, that is more available than it ever was in the past. At the same time, democratizing data is one of the ultimate aims of the DEFRA 25 year plan. And landscape decision making actually relies on transparency of the decision making criteria that are being applied. So democratic access to data is one of the key features of all of this. The DEFRA 25 year environment plan, for those of you who may not have had a look at this, um, actually has 10 different large goals and underneath each of these there is a lot more detail on what exactly the UK government wants to achieve on that time scale. Um, the first one is clean air. Um, there is a second one on clean and plentiful water, uh, cleaning up the river courses and lakes um, and the marine coastal waters and the oceans. Um, there is a goal on biodiversity, on thriving plants and wildlife, which includes restoring habitats and protecting biodiversity um, to have a principle of no net loss of biodiversity in landscape decisions. There is a goal on reducing the risk of harm from environmental hazards and on resources from um, nature to be used more sustainably and efficiently as well as enhancing beauty, heritage and engagement with the natural environment. There is a goal on mitigating and adapting to climate change, and that I will talk a little bit about in this presentation, um, as well as a goal on minimizing waste. Um, so there is a goal of um, uh, avoiding um, as much waste as possible and recycling as much as possible, and managing exposure to chemicals and reducing the risk to human health um, and to the environment from chemicals, as well as enhancing biosecurity by which is meant, for example, invasive tree diseases and invasive species. So quite ambitious um, and lots of details still need to be worked out how this is going to be rolled out and implemented and monitored. In addition to the DEFRA 25 year environment plan, in 2020, in November, Parliament passed the Agriculture Act. I think it got royal assent in November 2020, so it entered into a law. And that includes the environmental land management as a principle uh, where public money is paid for public goods. That means, in other words, payment for ecosystem services to farmers and landowners. Um, so as a farmer, you might in future get paid for improving air quality and water quality by using your land wisely. You might get paid for protecting plant species and protecting wildlife and creating and restoring habitats on your land as well as protecting and enhancing soil health, contributing to flood risk mitigation and retaining flood water on your land, for example, and climate change mitigation, by which I mean um, taking up carbon and other greenhouse gases from the atmosphere and reducing nitrous oxide emissions and other emissions to the atmosphere. 
The Agriculture Act was intended to boost the agricultural industry and create greater investment in new technology, as well as maximize land potential and increase competition, productivity and innovation. There is a seven-year transition period, which started in January this year, in 2021, and during that time it is intended to phase out the current financial reward system for farmers, which is called the Basic Payment Scheme, that is part of the Common Agricultural Policy under the European Union Agricultural Subsidy Arrangements. At the end of that seven-year transition period, all payments to farmers should follow the principle of environmental land management. Um, government also needs to produce a report evaluating the impact of any future trade deals on animal welfare and farming before that can be approved, um, as well as reporting on food security every three years, starting at the end of the current year. So I wanted to talk about the net zero carbon target, um, climate mitigation, a little bit more. Net zero carbon is being talked about a lot, and what it is is a target that is um, bound by law. Um, the UK Parliament actually passed that legislation in June 2019 and committed the UK to achieving net zero carbon emissions or net zero greenhouse gas emissions, to be precise, by 2050. <clears throat> now, there is some criticism about the time scale within the science community, the climate science community, um, because lots of people think actually that the net zero target needs to be met by 2030 worldwide in order to avoid dangerous climate change and limit the temperature rise to below one and a half or two degrees on average, but it is a start. <clears throat> so this is now UK law and what it means is the net emissions of greenhouse gases should be reduced by 100% relative to 1990 levels by the year 2050. Net zero emissions means the amount of greenhouse gas emissions is the same as the amount that is removed from the atmosphere. So that means there are two different types of actions that are possible. We could either reduce existing emissions or and or actively removing greenhouse gases from the atmosphere through technology and through land use change. Tree planting comes to mind as one option. So this graph shows you the UK total greenhouse gas balance. Um, there is a, a link to that report, uh, the reference to the report um, below that figure if you want to read more detail. Um, between 1990 and 2018, um, the UK has actually already reduced its net emissions of greenhouse gases quite a lot. Um, and this is being updated every year, so these figures are from 2019 and have been published in February 2020. If we look at it by sector, then the UK greenhouse gas emissions actually show that transport is now the biggest emitter of greenhouse gases in the UK, the biggest contributing sector to climate change, followed by the energy suppliers. Um, so, in 2016, transport overtook the energy sector in terms of the contribution to the greenhouse gas emissions. Businesses um, have slightly declined in their significance for greenhouse gas emissions. Residential is more or less stable, agriculture has been more or less stable, and the other sectors, um, some fluctuate a little bit. Waste management has decreased through better landfill management um, and other processes. But agriculture and land management are also a net emitter. So that is an interesting feature here. Um, and in the context of the new agricultural policy and the Agriculture Act in the UK, there is some debate around whether agriculture could be changed in a way that land management becomes a net sink of greenhouse gases, taking up greenhouse gases from the atmosphere instead of emitting greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. Renewable energy in the National Greenhouse Gas Account is also an interesting feature. Um, we have seen an expansion of renewable energy in the UK. And so one thing we have noticed in the Greenhouse Gas Accounts, when we look at the change from one year to the other, between 2018 and 2019, the biggest change in greenhouse gas emissions um, was the transport sector. But if we look at a longer time scale, between 1990 and 2019, then the energy sector actually is the one 
that had the biggest reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, uh, maybe with the exception of waste management, which has even more reduction, but is of a smaller absolute magnitude. So that shows that really technology has a role to play um, and switching to renewables um, can make a big contribution to achieving the net zero greenhouse gas emissions goal. In the National Greenhouse Gas Account in 2019, there's one interesting feature that I want to highlight here, um, and that is the change in the way that peatland greenhouse gas emissions are being accounted for, um, where in the previous greenhouse gas account in 2018, um, the land use, land use change and forestry sector uh, was thought to be a sink of greenhouse gases. Um, it has all of a sudden become a net source of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and that is shown in this graph here, where you can see that the gray line was the previous peatland emission estimate. Um, and the blue line is actually the land use, land use change and forestry sector in the UK with the new peatland carbon emissions and greenhouse gas emissions. So by revising the methodology, to make it compliant with the new Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Wetlands Supplement Guidance from 2013, that has already been around for some time, um, the peatland emissions in the UK uh, turned out to be much higher than previously thought. And um, because of this, um, it is important to recognize that something needs to be done about peatlands. Um, peatlands need to be restored and protected <coughs> And that includes, in my view, the need for a bit more research on possible ways of managing the land to preserve and restore peatlands in a way that retains the carbon, especially the carbon in the peat soil. So the water table in peatlands plays an important role um, in retaining that carbon. But there is a bit of a trade-off if you raise the water table in peatland there comes a time when the methane emissions from the peatland go up. So you might reduce the mineralization of the peat into carbon dioxide, but the trade-off is that more methane emissions are being produced as the soil becomes wetter. Um, but what this shows is actually <clears throat> the, uh, the report here by Chris Evans and co-authors has been hugely influential for the UK greenhouse gas account. Um, and actually made a big change to the way the figures turn out. What this also means is actually that now there is a lot of interest in Bayes in the Department for uh, Business and so on in how peatlands can be properly accounted for in the UK and also how peatlands can be managed in a way to turn them from a net source of greenhouse gases into a net sink because the UK actually has a lot of peatland in comparison to many other countries. And so it could make a big difference for achieving the net zero carbon goal by 2050, whether we get the peatland management right. How can we reach net zero carbon? Now, climate change has become a race against the clock, in my view. Um, and there is a big question mark around what the role of landscapes is in responding to the climate emergency and mitigating climate change. Can we reduce net greenhouse gas emissions from land use, land use change and forestry? And how can landscapes support the economic green recovery after COVID? There are papers out in the scientific literature now, including this one here in Science by um, Klein and Hartmann <clears throat> on climate change and dream mortality. Um, where scientists now discover that actually tree mortality is partly driven by climate change impacts. And so as the UK becomes more extreme in its weather events, which is indicated here on this map, this shows the rainfall amount in April 2020, um, which shows that this is all way below um, average um, in across the whole of the UK, then these long dry spells and extreme climate events may drive environmental changes that actually mean the carbon that is stored in the land and in the vegetation is not safe there and might be released again into the atmosphere as a consequence of climate change. So there is a lot of debate around the resilience of these land use decisions and landscape decisions that are being taken as part of the change to environmental land management at the moment. 
how the system of environmental land management and their payments is being implemented by DEFRA and whether all of this will be stable under scenarios of unavoidable climate change impacts. But I want to also talk a little bit more about the objectives of the Landscape Decisions Programme beyond just the climate mitigation. Um, so <clears throat> we basically want to create a new community from the diverse research base that is capable of articulating and underpinning a new decision framework for landscape decisions. Um, that means actually working across many different disciplines and engaging with a lot of different people and researchers from the arts and humanities, from engineering, from the environmental sciences community, from mathematics and from the modeling community, as well as informatics and other disciplines. Um, and bringing all of these behind the idea of contributing to a holistic framework for land use decision making. We recognize that we cannot deliver that holistic framework in full on the time scale and with the funding that is in the program. Um, it is a four year program and even though 10 and a half million is a lot of money, it is not quite enough to actually deliver everything that would be needed to have a fully functioning holistic framework. Um, but we hope to make substantial progress towards it because the time now is critical. The decisions are being taken in politics and we need to make sure that the research outcomes that the program is delivering informs those policy decisions insofar as that is sensible. Delivering research that supports policy developments is therefore one of the outcomes from the program and landscape decision making at multiple levels and scales um, will be one of those um, outcomes. So at Leicester, we are coordinating the, the program. We host the program coordination team, which I chair, and we fund through UKRI 60 multidisciplinary projects from across the UK with many, many different um, beneficiaries or institutes and research partners and universities. And we are working together as part of a wider network with other funders, such as the Royal Society and DEFRA, um, and some other initiatives such as the Living Landscapes Initiative in the Royal Society um, to make some progress towards this integrated holistic landscape decision making. The program itself has three interlinked work packages on developing new mathematics, building new model solutions and stimulating new thinking and communities. And cutting across these different work packages, we are also funding a number of landscape decisions translation fellowships that help us work across the different teams in the 60 different projects, not all of them, but some of them, and also translate some of the research outcomes from the projects into policy practice. So some of our fellows are actually based in some government departments or stakeholder organizations, but are working with some of the research projects going on in the program. In the work package one on new mathematics, some of the questions that have been asked in the Isaac Newton Institute workshops um, and in the related um, um, events that we've been holding include how can we improve statistical optimization tools to assess changes in natural capital as a function of landscape decisions. So far, there is a report by the UK, a natural capital committee, how the natural capital is changing but that information has to be updated ever so often. And if somebody takes a decision about their local landscape, there is no current means of knowing how the impact of that landscape decision might change the value of natural capital in that landscape. How can we incorporate uncertainty into decision-making processes? Um, uncertainty keeps coming up and there is a bit of a tension between wanting to represent uncertainty on the one side, but also not wanting to be sidetracked or having the di attention diverted away from the main application problem by thinking too much about uncertainty. So how much do we have to know about uncertainty and how do we represent uncertainty in the decision-making processes? Can we identify future land use strategies that address context dependency, cumulative effects and uncertainty propagation from one model to the other model, from using different models together in a landscape decision process. 
and from the uncertainty of how different policies might interact between government departments. And what methods can mathematics provide to assess hard to value landscape assets? Um, for under the natural capital assessment, um, these methods are well established, but there might be some assets in the landscape that are hard to value and that are not currently fully considered. We did a little word cloud coming out of the new mathematics projects and um, out of the different grants that are funded here. <clears throat> and this shows you that uncertainty features very strongly uh, next to decision making and modeling um, landscape decisions, of course, and decision making processes, spatial and temporal issues, um, scaling models, benchmarking, nonlinearities, and some other issues. The second work package on new model solutions focuses on some questions, for example, how existing, how existing ecosystem services models compare in terms of their accuracy, the model structure and the usability in decision making. Ecosystem services models might account for a single ecosystem service, say the cultural value of a landscape, um, but how does that actually interact um, with the decision making? Are people making use of that information and if so, how? What is the best way to simulate the synergies and trade-offs between multiple ecosystem services? Sometimes we might make a, a change in the landscape that actually enhances multiple different ecosystem services. So we might get cleaner air, cleaner water and enhanced cultural services coming out of a single um, landscape decision. For example, improving the habitat quality um, and improving the ecosystems in the landscape. But how is that actually simulated? Because at the moment, the ecosystem services models function as standalone models of a single ecosystem service. So they don't talk to each other, they don't inform each other, and therefore they cannot represent adequately synergies and trade-offs between multiple ecosystem services. How robust are our models under scenarios of climate change and unprecedented social economic shifts? If we see major changes in the economic environment, like we have seen as part of the Brexit deal, um, and the new export and import restrictions that are introduced, um, as well as the new environmental land management policy, um, then the question becomes actually how robust those models are. Um, can we still use them? Are they still valid? How can we enable more landscape decision makers to use the best available models? Are landscape decision makers in fact using any models? Because sometimes people are just deciding because of some other motivating factors. It might just be how they feel about their land, what they value about their land, and on their past experience in managing the land. How can model rep models represent people's values, identities, and experiences with ecosystem services in, in quotation marks, their landscapes? Um, <clears throat> for example, in the Northern Forest, which is a big afforestation um, area in the north of England, there is a lot of resistance from local communities against the idea of all of a sudden living in a massive big forest area, where in the past they have lived in an agricultural landscape. Um, and that probably came out of the lack of engagement with the wider public when the Northern Forest Plan was developed by government. So how can we actually include people's values and people, uh, people's priorities in the landscape decision processes? And in work package three on new thinking and communities, there is a lot of thought being put into how we can integrate culture and nature into landscape decision making processes. So this work package has a lot of um, projects by the Arts and Humanities um, Research Council, AHRC. Um, and the projects um, actually had a workshop at Leicester with us. Um, when we could still have physical meetings before COVID. And it was a really interesting experience for me. I'm, I'm not an AHRC um, researcher by my background, but it was very interesting to hear what people are doing in these projects. Um, there were projects that are asking how we can represent multi-sensory, multi-species perspective in decisions. Can we somehow go beyond a human-centric view of nature? and maybe think about how other species might view nature and how other species might view our landscape decisions and the impacts on them. 
What are the best ways of engaging disadvantaged groups in the decision-making processes that are changing our landscapes? Um, landscape decisions are often taken by landowners or land managers without engaging other relevant stakeholder groups. Can that change? And if so, how can it change? Because the ecosystem services that landscapes deliver quite often benefit much larger communities than the primary land use. If you consider an agricultural landscape, for example, people might use that for walking their dogs, for going cycling, um, for uh, going hiking. They might use that for other sports um, and they might use it for the cultural value, for the aesthetic value of the landscape. But those things probably don't feature very highly in decisions about what crop a farmer is going to grow. So how can all these things be brought together in landscape decisions? And finally, how can arts approaches help to make visible the cultural values and local benefits of ecosystem services to diverse groups of people? I'm giving you an example here of the uh, of a landscape art painting um, of Scotland, the Isle of Mull. Um, I've just picked this randomly. There's no connection to the program as such, but I was thinking what this um, landscape artwork uh, exhibits actually show is the artist's perception of landscapes. And <clears throat> you may be aware that there's a series on the television right now on the Landscape Artist of the Year. I really recommend watching that. It's really entertaining, um, where people paint the same landscape and you get completely different paintings at the end. So it depends partly on the lens of the observer what the landscape looks like. The program also has a big activity on integration and research synthesis. That includes program level workshops and events, and they create the glue between the projects um, and also link with outside initiatives such as the Living Landscapes program by the Royal Society, the DEFRA family of different stakeholder organizations and devolved administrations, um, and NGOs, non-governmental organizations and conservation organizations. We actually recorded short YouTube lectures that introduced the projects to other um, projects and also to policymakers. Those are available on the Landscape Decisions YouTube channel. If you want access, just um, send us an email. I'll show you the email address on the last slide. And we currently work together in writing groups that target specific program level outputs where we achieve some synthesis of different project outcomes, aiming to produce journal papers, policy reports, briefing notes, um, Beth Cole is actually coordinating a lot of this um, together with Rhian and Hart Chance, who is program manager. We also hold virtual writing retreats where groups of authors spend time connected via Zoom, working together on an output at the same time. And that seems to work really well. And I want to also mention challenges to landscape decisions from COVID. Um, as we come out of lockdown, um, the roadmap for this has just been announced recently. The UK is facing important decisions about how to restart our economy and social lives. What you see there on the left hand side of the screen is not a nuclear bomb. Actually, it's the California wildfires in 2020. That is the plume of smoke coming from those big wildfires that were absolutely catastrophic and destroyed property and uh, led to the loss of some human lives. Um, there is the Extinction Rebellion movement um, and the middle photograph shows the growing concern by a wider group of people in the population about the um, climate change and species extinction crisis worldwide, the loss of biodiversity, in other words, that is happening around the world and how we can stop it. And of course, we see the empty streets here on the right hand side where people have been confined to their homes and their workplaces in some cases um, for a large proportion of the last year. And that will have led to some environmental changes. For example, wildlife has started to colonize some of the car parks in National Trust properties. So how do we manage that when we come out of the lockdown? And what are the environmental impacts of the lockdown? If we look back at the past year, do we actually really know what the restrictions on movement and social distancing and the reduced visitor numbers to outdoor spaces have meant for the environment? 
there were some benef beneficial impacts. There might have been some unintended negative impacts. Uh, but how do we know this? Because there was very little field research going on. Some local public footpaths were heavily used, so others were overgrown because they could not be used. Conservation areas might have been left unmanaged in some cases, and wildlife may have flourished and ex expanded its range. Ecological surveys were paused for part of that time, so there will be data gaps that we have to deal with. Um, and that raises the question, how can such big changes be modeled mathematically and taken into account in decision-making tools? And to finish my talk, I really want to highlight this um, interesting um, idea of different cultural tribes um, that was posted in a blog by Annette Mikes from, say, Business School in Oxford University. Um, and she basically um, summarized these cultural tribes after John Adams, um, where different people worry about different risks. You know, we, we all know this from people we know. People worry about a recession, about public and mental health. People worry about possible war. They worry about pollution, unemployment, the extinction crisis, climate change, you name it. But interestingly, there are different groups of people um, with different views and they are categorized in these cultural tribes. Individualists see nature as being benign, predictable and forgiving to humans. Our economies are fragile and require protection from intervention. And therefore, the preferred management style is quite laissez-faire. Um, that means not much intervention. And that individualist approach actually came up with the concept of herd immunity at the beginning of COVID where the idea was if you just let nature take its course, people will get infected by COVID, but then herd immunity will kick in and everything is going to be all right. That didn't turn out to be true, um, but that is the kind of mindset of an individualist in the sense of those cultural tribes. The egalitarian cultural tribe see nature as being fragile and unforgiving whereas the economy is robust enough to allow the precautionary principle protecting the public from harm. Egalitarian values meant that several countries with COVID switched into a rescue at all cost mode and threw all their resources at fighting the COVID pandemic. Interventionists think that within limits, nature behaves predictably. And that means the nature of this response is interventionist and relies on cost-benefit analyses as far as possible. So interventionists you can think about as being driven by information and making decisions based on predictions of the future state of nature. And fatalists finally think nature is beyond human control. There's nothing we can do. We are all hostage to the outcomes of policy changes we cannot influence and we um, we can actually think about the apathy of that group of fatalists and the problems of overcoming it. How do we get this group out of their passive uh, attitude towards policy and towards nature? Um, that is a major challenge to not just policy, but actually also to the landscape decisions program. If we think about engaging with people, engaging with local communities, how do we actually manage to engage with the fatalists who think, oh, we can't do anything anyway? So it is a bit of a problem, but I think that cultural tribe concept relates, in my mind at least, um, to many of the complex problems around landscape decisions that I mentioned in my talk. So on this slide, there is the contact address landscapes at leicester.ac.uk, where you can find out more information and ask about the YouTube channel if you want. Um, and we have the program secretariat at UKRI. Now, this is more if you want to contact the funder. So I, I recommend going to the program coordination team at Leicester. There is the program website and you can follow